Victor and Chine will take their questions and then we'll see. Is there any on YouTube? You sent it. Is that there? Did you send it? All right. So we'll look at uh, whether we'll take Voero and what have you. So, Victor, what's your question, please? Okay, my question is on um, the relationship between. Is there any relationship between imagination and prayer? Hmm. Like when we pray, do we imagine the result we pray? Since Jesus is already interceding for us, do we still need. Um, is there any need for. Or what's the um, relationship between imagination and prayer? That's actually a really good question. I love that question. That's a good, insightful question. Chinea, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, my question is, in the sermon, we were talking about how we shouldn't become apathetic towards our sin, so we shouldn't just accept sin. But at the same time, we also know that there's no condemnation. Where do we draw the line? Because sometimes there's the, there's the danger of feeling so guilty, 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 and then you don't accept the grace of God. So how do we, how do we balance that a bit better? Fantastic question. Fantastic. Okay. Um, any other question in house? No. No. Okay. Good. So let, let's go with uh, Voeros. Voeros. Voeros was. Um, how do we balance faith and rationality? How do you balance faith and rationality? For example, if someone tells a fellow believer that God told them to resign. We are too quick to respond that we don't think it's from God. But there are some things of faith in scriptures that tend not to go with rationality. Like Abraham sacrificing his son. And I do agree, it's not often that such happens. Even though faith and rationality are not antithetical, how do we approach those leadings that don't look seemingly rational? Did you guys get the question? Then Ayodhya Jusanusi says, what are those things that Christians share or believe regardless of... Oh, Ufama has come back. So Ayodhya, I don't think we can take your own because Ufama's own... Oh, but there's Nana Durisu. Okay, who's on? How many have I just said now for? Four. Four. Okay, so... The fifth one just dropped. Okay, let's take Ayodhya's own. Nana... Nana, um, we're, going to have, we're going to have to move your question to, to next week, please, if you don't mind, okay? So, Adeji uh, says, what are those things that Christians share, believe, regardless of denomination? In other words, how do I determine that a person is a brother or a sister? Then, Ufama's question. Um, Ufama, uh, it's two questions in one. I don't know how we're going to do it, too. All right. Someone asked a question about this Ufama's question. Someone asked a question about the Trinity and how it is this, that is expressed in our worship two weeks ago. I have two follow-up questions. Two follow-up questions. One, Jesus said he will go to the Father and the Father will send another comforter, all caps for another, the Spirit of Truth. Later, Jesus said, if you love me, my Father will love you and we, all caps, my Father and I will come and make our abode with you. The first mention is often used to say that only the Holy Spirit is given to us, but the second reference suggests that the Father and the Son both come to abide in the person. Which is it? You guys understand the question? No, you didn't understand the question. Okay. So the question basically is, in, in the, um, there was a response, um, there was a question about how do, do you in practical terms, um, relate with the Trinity. And so we spoke about that. Now, but now the question was, if in one side, it says that Jesus said that he will send the Spirit, another comforter, when he goes. But then in another passage, it says, not the Spirit, but that the Father and the Son will be the ones that will come and make their abode. So Jesus is saying he's sending the Spirit alone. But now we are hearing that it is the Father and the Son that are coming. So which one is it? That's the question. Okay? Ufama, there's a second question. You don't get two questions. Sorry. We move the, to the next one. They are not very related. They are not the same thing. It's, it's not the same thing. Okay. Let's try it. If we see if it's the same thing. Number two. She says, Jesus said, God is spirit. And he who worships him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But the pastor 
said, <laughs> i.e., yours truly, uh, Pastor Femi said, well, the pastor, okay, no, no, I get the sub. But the pastor said, God the Father is not the Holy Spirit. If he isn't, if he isn't, what or which spirit is he? Because you remember it says God is spirit. And so if he's not the spirit, then what or which spirit is he? We know the spirit of truth refers to the Holy Spirit. What of the spirit of wisdom or the spirit of love? Are there other spirits of God apart from the Holy Spirit? And which one is actually the spirit of the Father? Since we know he too is spirit. They are not the same question. Don't cheat. We don't have, people don't cheat in the house of the Lord. We'll take your second question the week after. Okay. And then there was one more person. No, that's it, right? That's it. That's five. Okay. So, Nana, Nana, your question is next week, okay? Next week. All right. Um, I will start with Victor. Victor, excellent question. Victor's question is, what is the, what's the relationship between imagination and prayer? I have never heard that question asked before. And I wish that question has been asked before. That's an absolutely brilliant question because I don't think it's often spoken about. What is the relationship between prayer and imagination? Everything. Actually, everything. Let me give you an example. So, for those who are more medically inclined here, um, they probably will correct me. I, I don't want to be overly, I, I'm not overly uh, specific, but I do think this is correct. Like, our brain, our brain has, I think, about four, broadly four different um, um, uh, systems, if you like. But let me talk about the, the third and the fourth um, I would like to say most developed. Well, the least developed is what we call the neofrontal cortex, right? That has more to do with our analytical functions, logical reasoning, systemic reasoning, all of those things. Conceptual um, uh, reasoning. But, fo but, but focuses more on the abstract. So, for instance, when we are, let's say, when, when they are teaching you math, right? and they're doing it in abstract forms, like four plus four, right? You are not imagining things. You are just, you are, you are using that, right? When you are trying to solve um, things that, you know, syllogisms and different kinds of things that go with logical reasons, you know, when you're reading non-fiction, right? That is the part that is actually much more activated. And I'll even add, when you are listening to certain kinds of sermons, Right, where they're breaking things down. What is happening? Like when told me many times when Tom was preaching, you're going through this passage that tells you about leprosy. So what you're doing is now you're expanding your understanding of leprosy. You are, we are joining things together. Our new, front, our new frontal cortex is much more what is, um, 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 is um, being used. Now, people have actually studied this in some ways. Have you ever noticed that when you go for prayer meetings and people start talking too much about breaking things down, actually, your, your prayers actually get shorter. Who knows that? Your ability to pray gets shorter. It actually, yeah, some of they're looking at me, actually, no, that's what happens. You actually, the more you actually exercise that, you start praying, and this is where you pray, say, it's true, you know, uh, we, God preach about mercy. Lord, make us more merciful. Lord, make us more merciful. Help me to show mercy to this person, blah, blah, all of that. The same thing when you are doing your personal devotions, you studied something and now pray. What do you do? If you are maybe a Presbyterian tradition, if you are in a high Baptist tradition, Anglican, you have a nice summarized prayer that encapsulates everything. And honestly, when you say that, there's not much more to say. Why is it, though, that when you go into Pentecostal circles, that somehow, honestly, they give you mercy. We, we just, mercy is the thing. Then you don't just say, God, make me merciful. It's now like, 
God make me merciful. For then you now start saying, for blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Lord, don't just make me merciful. Help, enable me to obtain more mercy. Lord, I pray that in your mercy, you will bring me close to you. Have you never, how many of you have entered prayer where all of a sudden it seems like vistas of things just are opening? Who knows that? Yeah, you know that. And there's a difference, and there are times when that thing isn't closed. Have you also noticed that oftentimes, not all, necessarily all the time, oftentimes that happens when there is music around. Have you often noticed how sometimes when you play music and you're worshipping, when you start to pray after, all of a sudden it seems like there's more words. You know why? Because you are not using your neofrontal cortex. Your music actually focuses on something called your limbic system. And the limbic system is more focused on your emotions and also your imagination. So sometimes people come and say, why is it that we are playing music during when we are praying? Uh, you're not just trying to manipulate. No, we're not trying to manipulate. We're just trying to hit you where, the way God has designed you. Your brain actually works with it. So imagination is important because, as you said, if I am so focused on breaking things down and it's time to pray, when it comes to praying that Jesus actually intercedes for us, all I'm just going to remember is I have an intercessor that is interceding for me, so Lord, help me intercede. When our imagination is stirred up, all of a sudden, you close your eyes, and what do you see? You actually look and you almost see Jesus at the right hand of God interceding for you, and now you are now inspired. Imagination has everything to do with prayer. Everything. It says that, you know, um, um, Stephen, when Stephen was being stoned, what did he do? He was praying to God, but he says that he saw the heavens open. So imagination, I would say, so if you want to improve your prayer life, I would say put the things around you that enable for imagination. This is why, literally, like, I, I look for pictures. I, I, I have some particular songs that help me. So let's say I was listening to this. How many of you? I feel, you would not feel Driscoll here. He's a young guy, pretty young guy. Uh -huh. I love Phil Driscoll's um, I Exalt Thee. He's I Exalt Thee. You know, Phil Driscoll was Nathaniel Bassi before Nathaniel Bassi was. So there's the voice and then there's the trumpet. And when he does I Exalt Thee, it just opens up Revelation 4 and 5. Isaiah chapter 6, the visions of, of, of the throne room of God. But if I just sometimes just go there and read it, you know, there's not, it, it's not, it helps, so it's okay. Oh. But there's something when he starts doing that, I exalt thee and the, oh, it's something. So I would say, guys, if you want to improve your prayer life, you want to extend it, use the things that fuel your imagination. Music is one of those. And, and engage your limbic system. And once you start seeing pictures, all of a sudden you can extend your prayer time. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the word doesn't matter. I'm not saying thinking doesn't matter. I'm saying that thinking matters and also our Im imagination also matters. I love that question. Thank you for it, Victor. And your name is great. Eh? I didn't answer the question. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Uh -huh. No, I was getting there. <laughs> Father, for, forgive me for, for the slight. I have an issue with inac inaccuracy. Uh, it wasn't okay. a lie. I, I was asking with respect to, to results. Result. Ah, wow. Well, well. Live in fantasy. Now why was, why pray? Start talking about brain. <laughs> uh, start talking about your frontal yeah, yeah, cortex. Yes. Was... But it was good. It was good. Okay, yeah. all right. Okay, good, good. Thank you. Now, in terms of the results, like if you imagine something, and the thing comes to pass. I, I'm a bit, to answer that question, I'm a bit, I, I'm going to end up displeasing two kinds of people. The people that say that's all that matters, and the people that say it doesn't matter at all. Let me start with the people that say that's all that matters. Like, just imagine anything, and once you imagine it, in your prayer, it's going to happen. Eh, no. Like, no. There are many, in fact, first of all, Thank God God doesn't give you everything you imagine. Because um, some people, they imagine, I've heard this one, that they imagine that the pastor was their husband, even while the pastor was already married. <laughs> you see that kind of thing. No, 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 no. And there are some other things that even though they are legitimate, they are legitimate for everyone, 
God knows that it's not legitimate, it's not legitimate for us. So sometimes what we are imagining is based on covetousness, and God cares about defeating our covetousness more than giving us just what we desire. God is a good God. Secondly, is that thinking and imagining just doesn't create things in and of itself. It doesn't create things. And the thought that that just moves God in some kind of magical way. Now, God is sovereign. So, no, it doesn't in that regard. But in another regard, it does from this standpoint. We are created in the image of God. By the way, I know I, had, I did an FAQ about confession, positive confession or something like that. We are created in the image of God, which means that we reflect God and we do things that, that God like. And when John says, behold, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. God, God, what God is going to do in the earth has been seen. When he says that the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, God sees, he sends his word, and it actually accomplishes what he sent out for. Now, if we are God-like, that means also that God gives us that ability to, to envision things. Now, what doesn't happen is that when you envision a thing, that is what functionally makes the thing come to pass. No. What happens when you envision a thing, you are fixed on the thing, you have a new level of focus, and so you work towards it, but you also pray towards it. And so you can envision yourself not being in, in a particular situation for a long time. You can envision and you work towards the things that you envision, and you pray towards the things that you envision while submitting yourself to the will of God. I would say if you are not doing that, quite often you will not achieve some of those things. So in that regard, I don't want to kill people's imaginations. I think you should, we should be imagining things. But at the same time, I don't want people to then think foolishly that just by imagining things, that in itself creates it. No, no, no. So hopefully I didn't upset the two people. Hopefully I brought them together. All right, now I ended up answering two questions in one. Thank you, Victor. Well done, Victor. All right, uh, Chin and Ye's question on apathy for sin versus guilt, yeah, and, and how do you kind of balance it? So, on the one hand, um, God wants our conscience to always be sharp enough so that if we commit a wrong, commit a sin, it should always register with us that we have done something. So, you get the feeling of initial guilt when you sin. And that's a good thing because it, it's then what draws you to the cross to go back to God to ask for forgiveness, right? And, you know, and that whole process that was talked about. And when you don't do that, you violate your conscience over and over again that you become dead. So apathy, apathy sets in when you constantly ignore the initial, I'll call it the initial guilt you feel over a sin, over an offense, right? And that's what apathy does for you. Now, sometimes we have an, uh, where sometimes just an over, overdeveloped feelings of guilt, but sometimes it's frankly the attack of the enemy where even after you've now gone back to God and you have submitted yourself to him and confessed your sin, you have what I would then call lingering guilt. You've dealt with it before the Lord. And instead of receiving the forgiveness, forgiveness of God and the word of God uh, to help you, you know, remove that feelings of guilt, you know, the enemy comes to remind you of that, to, again, to pull you back. And so the balance is that you know, ensure that your, that your conscience is always tender, that when you get that initial uh, feeling of guilt, that you can turn to the Lord and take it before him. And then what you then do after that, you then continually remind yourself of the word of God that in Christ, there is no condemnation. In Christ, my sins are forgiven. Even if it's a sin that is, you know, the Bible talks about besetting sin. Even if it's something that you fall into over and over again, you go to the Lord for the forgiveness, but also for the strength and the grace to overcome that sin. Now, part of uh, the underlying uh, sort of maybe thought behind your question, it happens almost every age or every stage in Christianity where people say, because the thought of my sin ends up crushing me. You know, when I think about my sin, it crushes me. So they'll say, people will say, oh, I have this thing called a guilt consciousness. And so, so some, some people move in a, you know, a theology a particular way that say, in order to get rid of that guilt consciousness, we should not even contend with that feeling of guilt, with that sin. Just say, you know, in Christ Jesus, all is forgiven. And I really need to go back to the cross over and over again. That's a wrong response. So that's a, it is an attempt to, to, to escape the crushing weight of guilt. Then people do not want to contend or view that sin at all. And that's where apathy actually sets in. So I've said the best approach is the scriptural approach. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful, he's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us 
of all unrighteousness. And so the way you balance it is always come before the Lord. Uh, from the time you become a Christian to the time you pass away, you will come before the Lord many times. And God doesn't, Jesus doesn't set any limits. So there will, be no, there will be no reason whatsoever for you to never come before the Lord to come for uh, forgiveness and for cleansing. And so the balance is just making sure that you're applying the word of God to yourself while keeping your conscience tender. Thank you. Um, let's see. Ufoma, Ufoma's first question today, and that's, he's still talking about, you know, this thing about the Trinity. Um, Jesus says, I will send another comforter. And by that, he was talking about the spirit of truth. But then, later in that same chapter, it says, the Father and the Son will come and make their abode in you. So, is it the spirit that is coming? Or is it the Father and Jesus that are coming? Now, let me say some alternatives to this. What are some possible answers? In one way, you can harmonize it. You can say, for instance, that it's one being, but different, with different expressions. So, because the Father and Jesus are coming... But the spirit is also coming. You're talking about the same entity, but that entity can show, can express himself as father, son, and spirit. Okay? So one person but three different modes. Right? So I, me, now. I am fa- um, husband to Tosin, one mode. I am father to Tofumi and Timmy, another mode. And then I am a um, um, a, the the, the thorn in the flesh to Yemi. (laughs) Right? The thorn. A thorn, right? No, friend. Friend, 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 friend. friend, thorn. What's the difference? All right. I'm going through different modes. So it can be that you have God, and God is Father, right? He can express himself as Father. He can express himself as Son. He can express himself as spirit, so that as he's coming, right, it's the one person that is coming. Now, this, this thinking would say that it's one being and one person, just like we human beings, right? I am the person, Femi, and I am the being, Femi, and I can, but I can express myself in three different modes. That's one way of looking at it. Um, another way of looking at it would be Femi the three people, there are three people coming and there are three beings coming. There is the Father, he's coming. There is the Son, he's coming. And there's the Spirit, he's coming. And these three beings, uh, these three persons are also three entities. So it's still the same enti- uh, being and person together. It's just that now, if there are three persons, then there are three beings. That's, an, that's another way of looking at it. Do you, you get the difference? Yeah. Right? Okay. Now, I, if, when you come all of Scripture, those two, those two, res, those two uh, options I don't think are right. I don't think Scripture teaches them. But here's what we can say. Here's what I don't think we can say. We can't say... Uh, okay, maybe... Should I explain that third part again? The second one again. Should I explain the second one? The second one is... The Father comes, the Spirit comes, the, the Son comes. And the Father coming is like me coming. The Spirit coming is like Yemi coming. And the, 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 the Son coming is like Ufama coming. So three beings. Do you understand? So the first one is one being and person and three expressions. The second one is three beings that are three persons. Do we understand that? So those are ways you can think about that, that... Jesus says, I will send the Spirit, and then, but the Father and, I will send the Spirit to you, but then I and the Father will come to you. You can either think of the Father and Spirit and Jesus or the Son as three beings and three persons, or think about it as one person, one person but with three expressions. What you can't say is, what you can't do is to say, I'm only going to take the verse that says the Spirit is coming, and then 
I'm not doing anything with the father and son. I know the father and son are not there. We can't do that. And we can't just go to the one that says, the father and son are coming, the spirit is coming. We can't. We don't have to. Those two verses are in the Bible. So you must have a way of harmonizing them. Now, I said those two options, I don't believe are right. And the church historically, all, almost most churches all around the world don't subscribe to that. The first is what we call, is um, an ancient heresy called modalism. Modalism, which is one God, three different modes. The problem with that, the problem with that view is this. When Jesus says, I will send the Spirit, it's because Jesus himself is living. And he says, I will send another comforter, another one. Now, if that other comforter is just an expression of himself, that makes nonsense of the word another. Another presumes that there is an other. Do we understand that? Another presumes that there is an other. So if Jesus says, I will send another comforter, but he's talking about a sort of just him acting in another capacity, there is a problem there. If you fast forward also, that was John 14, if you fast forward to the culmination of John 14, 15, 16, in 17, Jesus prays. And when he's praying, he's praying to someone. And he says, I want, to, I want you, the love that I had from the beginning. He says, first, he said, Father, glorify your son. How can, I, I, I can't, in my capacity as father, as father to my children, glorify, say I want to glorify myself as husband with the glory that I had before. It assumes that there is an other. So I don't believe modalism is right because it presumes that when you talk about the father, the son, and the spirit, are we together? The father, the son, and the spirit, you are talking about Others. They are different. They are others. So, how, so then, if you say they are others, their modalism can't be correct. Now, let's go to the other view. The other view is what we call tritheism. That is three distinct gods. Some people say, well, there is a supreme god, similar to Yoruba pantheon. There is a supreme god, the father, and then there are lesser gods. They are divine, the son and the spirit. The problem with that view is, if you must believe that view, you, your Bible should no longer be in an Old and New Testament together. Because if there's one way you can summarize, I'm not saying it's the only way, but one way you can summarize that what God was trying to treat throughout the Old T Testament is that there is one God. Like, all he's kept trying to stop the children of Israel from doing is adopting the religions that say that there's more than one God. It will make an absolute nonsense. But also in the 1 Corinthians 8 verse uh, 6, is this verse 8? Well, 1 Corinthians 8 verse 6, Paul reaffirms what, you know, what is called the Hebrew Shema, right? The, the Deuteronomy 6, where there says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. Paul then reaffirms and says, We also believe that. Yet for us there is but one God, the Father for whom all things came and for whom we believe. But the way he then does the Hebrew Shema is that he modifies it. Because he then adds something, and there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ. That one Lord is the same Lord that was used in the Old Testament when he says, One Yahweh, one Lord, one Yahweh, where the Lord your God is one. He takes, that's Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4, uh, sorry, Hebrews, Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, he says, we believe that there's one God, right, who is um, um, the Lord our God, right, the Lord, Yahweh, our God is one. All right, see it. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. That the Lord, now go back, go back to 1 Corinthians um, um, 8 verse 6. When he says, and there is but one Lord, he's saying, the same God that is Father, that is Yahweh, is also saying that this Jesus Christ is also. So has Paul now descended into some kind of bitheism where he's saying there are two gods? No, because he said, I affirm that there is one. 
And this is what has been a classical foundational Christian teaching. That in the oneness of God, there is also a plurality. What example on, in the world do you have where the, you can have one being and multiple persons? What, what example? None. And you shouldn't expect to have the same thing. Well, though we are God-like, we are not God. At some point, you have to be able to say, no matter how great a Mac computer is, the Mac computer is never Steve Jobs. And no matter how great the Mac computer is, he's not as complex as Steve Jobs is. The brain is much more complex. And no matter how wonderful we human beings are, we are never going to be like God. So what the Bible teaches is this. One God, one being, but multiplicity. One, the Father is God. The Son is God. The Spirit is God. So now you see the otherness. There is another. But that another does not lead to multiple gods. Is this, is this, is this clear? Is this clear? One God, multiple persons. Now, how does that then relate to that passage? Very simple. Not very simple, but simple. When Jesus says, I am going to leave, he says to the disciples in that same part, he says, I will not leave you as orphans. I have been with you. He says, I will send you the spirit of truth who what has been with you but now will be in you. How was he with them? He was with them in the person of Jesus because he says for us that Jesus was the one that had the spirit descend on him and he had the spirit without measure all in the book of John. So in the presence of the Messiah, the spirit of God was on that Messiah and he was with the disciples. But that spirit that was on the Messiah, that, was anoint, that anointed the Messiah, was now, when Jesus was returning, was now going to live in a new reality with those disciples. He was going to be what? In them. Therefore, the spirit is bringing, listen very closely, the spirit is bringing the presence of God to the people. He brings the, spirit, the, the presence of Jesus. So when we say Jesus is here, when we, anytime we say Jesus is here, Jesus himself that ascended in the way he ascended is not here. We are awaiting Jesus' return. But Jesus is here in the spirit of God. In fact, in Acts chapter 16 and I think in 1 John, sometimes he's not just called the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's called the spirit of, sorry, in Philippians, the spirit of Jesus or the spirit of Christ Jesus. So maybe I can go with the second one. Who, the Holy Spirit, are there many spirits? No, when he says God is spirit, he's not the same. God is spirit is not, God is the Holy Spirit. God is spirit is saying God is not material like us. God isn't like us, right? That is what it means. Not, so sometimes we have to be careful with how we do word studies. Not every word that occurs in the Bible when it's just said in that means exactly the same thing. Do you understand what I mean? Right? You have to look at the context. So when it says God is spirit, he's saying God is not a man. That's what he's saying. He's not now talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. When you now talk about the person of the Holy Spirit, this person of the Holy Spirit is described in many ways. He can be described as the Holy Spirit depending on what character you are trying to show. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the, we won't say the Spirit of the Father, you see the Spirit of Jesus, you see the Spirit of Wisdom, you see all of that is, the, is telling you the character that the, the Spirit is able to bring. So when we then say we have received the Spirit and we talk about spiritual gifts, well, if he's the spirit of wisdom, he can impart wisdom to us. If he's the spirit of uh, knowledge, right, he can impart knowledge to us. If he's the spirit of love, he can impart love to us. Because he's the spirit that, takes, that brings the love of the Father and, and takes it to the Son. So, who, which spirit is it? No, it's not, first and foremost, when he said God is spirit, is not talking about God is the Holy Spirit. That's not what, that, not what that passage is. So I want to distinguish that passage from that. It's talking about the nature of God. But then, when you are now talking about the Holy Spirit, who is divine, right? You are now talking about different, there are different ways he talks about the Holy Spirit. He's not saying there's only one thing you can call him. He uses the character. So when you say God is holy, 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 the Spirit of God, therefore, is holy, holy spirit. But God is also wise. God is full of wisdom, God is full of love, so he's the spirit of love, all of those things. Okay? So, question answered.
Ayodeji, Sanusi. What are those things that Christians share, believe, regardless of denomination? In other words, how do I determine that a person is a brother or sister? So if you look at uh, John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only uh, begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That contains the kernel of something that uh, almost all Christian denominations believe, that first of all, that God exists, God who is the creator of the universe, and God has a, a character or something that defines him, eternal, his spirit, but he's a creator God. Um, it talks about Jesus who came to us through virgin birth and who died on the cross to take away all of our sins. Um, most Christians, uh, denominations believe in, even as that message is coming to us, the Bible that we use, that it is the very word of God. You know, and that's why you know, we can trust it. And that's why it's the authority on how we are saved in the first place. Um, the, that scripture presumes that there is, uh, that, you know, because it says it's going to save us, it presumes that we are, that we are um, in danger, that in fact we are condemned. So sin has taken over the world. Man has fallen. God created man. Man fell. Uh, and, and, and man fell and therefore needs salvation. So Christians believe in the reality of a literal hell, but also a literal heaven, the place where God dwells, or uh, an, an eternal future uh, for all Christians uh, uh, that are saved. Uh, most denominations believe in what else? Heaven, hell, Christ's birth, and, and uh, you know, the way that we then become saved is that we put our faith in Jesus Christ for the salvation of our souls. Now, beyond that, and maybe some other things, there are almost every other denomination differs on something else. The way, so most, most Christians, most denominations believe, for example, that we're meant to either celebrate baptism or communion, but the way they celebrate it might be different, right? Uh, most, uh, you, know, you know, so in terms of sacraments, there, there are sort of uh, differences. But I would say John 3.16 is a good way to look at um, what is common to every faith, and then over the years, and it's a bit more than that, over the years, what the churches have done through councils and things like that, it's come up with different creeds and that sort of show us what we all believe is, uh, 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 is common to all the faiths of all the different denominations. And if I tie to the question, therefore, of how do I know, you know that somebody is my brother or my sister, I would say if anyone, a, a man or woman, you know, anyone approaches and says, I have put my faith in Jesus Christ, for the salvation of my soul. I believe that Jesus died for my sins, went to the cross, and rose again, right? I think, I think you need to embrace that person as a brother, a brother or sister. Now, I, you know, there's a bit of caveat there. Christians believe many, many things, or denominations believe many, many things that you will disagree with, or some other things on secondary issues that, from your perspective, may be wrong. But I think that you would, if you, if you, we should err on the side of when somebody says, I'm a brother, somebody says, I've embraced the Lord Jesus Christ, you embrace the person back as a Christian. And um, I'm reminded of, um, you know, for, uh, you know Ap Apollos, one of the, you know, sort of apostles that came in New Testament church. When Aquila and Priscilla met with him, he had not even, you know, sort of heard the full gospel as it were. And yet he was a believer and he was preaching. And what they did was they called him, drew him, and, you know, and the Bible says that they showed him fully uh, what the message of Jesus, what the gospel of Jesus was all about, and they were able to move on in communion with him. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, it's that last bit you just said, and I think, so all the other ones you said, I agree. I'm, I'm, this, this one is a bit of a caution to people. Um, is the way the question is framed, I just want to add a bit of caution there, which is, the question is framed in such a way that I can identify a believer by what they believe. And it's like, hey now, believer, believe. Yeah, but don't forget Christians are not just called believers. We're called disciples, we're called saints, we're called followers of the way, we're all different things. So if you, if, you, if you elevate belief, the things that we believe, as the main thing through which you know who is a brother or a sister, you will be You'll be elevating, and this features some of the various questions. You'll be elevating rationality to a position that the Bible does not put it in. In other words, most of us got saved before we started believing the right things about our faith. It's not when you believe up onto a certain level the right things that you become saved. Like, 
Think about the woman at the well. What belief did she know? Did she have? She was already, you know, many of the people that came to meet Jesus, they were made whole just because they came to Jesus. All right? And I say that because there are many factors. The gospel is uniquely sent to people who are illiterate. Right? To start thinking about systematized doctrine and everything. Many people, they don't get it. Look at what we just did with Trinity. I'm not saying that the Trinity is not a simple concept to just grasp like that. And so some people can just go, see, it says one God, God gave me a revelation, Jesus Christ is God, there are no other. And sometimes we quickly, immediately just say, that person cannot be a Christian because they don't believe things that the church has always believed. Be very careful with that. Which leads me to say, how do you know somebody that is a believer? There are three tests, often, that we can put. One John does. One John gives three tests. There's the test of... The one you're talking about, orthopraxy. Think about it this way. It's like a three, I heard someone once describe it as, it's like a three-leg chair, right? A three-leg chair. And it has to stand on these three things. So right belief, right um, 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 behavior, and right belonging. So think about the first one. John says, Test every spirit, but not every, because not all spirits belong to Christ, right? And then says that um, if anyone, this is how you know who is a believer, if anyone says that Jesus Christ, if, this is how you test the spirit of the Antichrist. If anyone says that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh, that is the spirit of Antichrist. Now, John has a way of speaking very absolute terms. So don't just say if it's, this is the one doctrine that we use. He was dealing with his time. And so there were people that were, that were redescribing how... Um, who Jesus really was. Some people would say something like uh, that Jesus was a person, the spirit of the Christ came upon him in his baptism. And then when he died, you know, because he said, into your hand I commit my spirit. So the spirit of the Christ left him. So that was a Jesus that was, you know, those, that, there are some people who are saying, no, that, so that spirit of Christ, there was a gnosis, there was a, 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 the Christ is really a spirit, right? But he said, no, 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 Jesus, the son of God came in flesh. So, there is right doctrine. This is the test of orthodoxy. Orthodoxy. Orthodoxy just means sound doctrine. So there's the test of what we believe. Now remember I said it's a three-legged stool. So right belief does matter. But sometimes, I don't know, you know, there used to be one, one of these uh, chairs for a long time that was a bit rickety. But you could still sit on it. So sometimes the belief needs to be straightened, but it's not totally, you understand. There's also right behavior. He says, whoever, this all I'm quoting is one John now. He says, whoever is born of God does not continue to commit sin. And he also says, if you say that you're a believer and your brother is suffering and you, you, you don't have the bowels of compassion to care for that brother, you, you are not really, the love of God does not dwell in you. So there's the orthopraxy, the right behavior. Right what? Believes. Right behavior. But there's also the be right belonging. You can't just be on your own. So he says, listen, these guys that left us were not really part of us. Because if they were part of us, they would have stayed with us. This is 1 John chapter 2. So in other words, God, Jesus didn't just come to save you. He came to save you into a community. So right belonging, right behavior, right believing. It's a three legs too. To what extent must I behave? To what extent must I believe? To what extent must I belong? There is no, there is no actual formula for it. There is no, it is this particular doctrine. Or else you turn what it means to be saved into a formula. It's saying those things matter. And by and large, what Christian leaders are meant to do is when we see someone come in, if the person does not have any of the legs, he has not even met Jesus, he's not even a chair. All right? So what we are meant to try and do is to lead the person to Christ. But then we are meant, once you lead the person to Christ, all the three legs are there. But then the three legs can be weak. And what we are meant to try to do is to make the legs st st strong. So I'm, make, I'm putting a caution out there because, again, if you are the thinking type of person, you want to quickly disqualify people as being believers or not based on their, what they believe. Whereas they can look at you and say, ah, you, you, you don't, I, I don't know much, but you, you pray three minutes every week. And whereas that person is prays three hours every week and say, can you call yourself a Christian? That person is a praxis person. 
Whereas some people, they're always in church and say, you, you're just a lone ranger and all that. You are not being with the people of God. You're not serving the people of God. You're not helping the people of God. And that person is a, um, is a belonging person. So that's what I'll say. Now, Vore, what's the place of rationality? Uh, so let me use that as a segue um, into this. What's the place of rationality and Christianity? There is a place for it, right? We have a book. We think, we think systematically. There's a place for rationality. But ration, ra, the rationality is different from rationalism. Rationalism is not built on the foundation of revelation. Rationalism is built on the foundation of reason. Christianity is built on the foundation of revelation, and we engage with the revelation partly through reason. So we don't believe in something illogical. It's just that logic is not the foundation of what we believe. We believe that God has spoken. God is our foundation. God has spoken. Now, through what God has spoken, we then engage with our reason. And our reason, as we engage with it, will tell us that reason is not enough. All right? Therefore, part of what we believe is that God continues to speak, and God can speak through prophecy. Now, how do we then balance the prophecy? So somebody says, God told me you should resign from your job. Can I just say to everyone here, if somebody comes to meet you and say, God told you to resign for your job, the first thing you need to do is say, press pause. I don't care, wait, just press what? Pause, right? Because God generally doesn't tell people to resign from their job. I'm not saying God never tells. I'm just saying God generally never tells people. Are we following? He never tells people. Now, second, God generally does not tell someone to tell someone to resign from their job. Even more generally. Again, I use the word generally. Okay? So there's a need to first pause. Now, now, let me walk it back. If God tells someone to come and tell me to resign from my job, I don't resign from my job until me, myself, I have heard God speak. Why? Because... If I lose my job, and then the person now says, I dreamt again, and it was that God was saying that the job you resigned from was a good job that you resigned from, that you are now in your current calling. I would say, ah, ah. You, God needs to reveal to me right now why I should not beat you totally. <laughs> so the consequences of that is not going to be on the person, it's going to be on me. So before I take a massive step like that, ah, me, I need to hear. I can't just hear prophet said. So if someone tells you that, you first have to be able to say, okay, God, and this, this is how the prophetic works. You always have to confirm. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. All of you should weigh what was said. Then the next thing would be, okay, how then do I test it? Then you have to test with your, there's, there's, there's the inner voice. There is scripture. And then there is, does this lead to edification? Inner voice, scripture, and how does this lead to some kind of edification? So the inner voice is just an inner witness. I, don't, I can't put a formula around it. Sometimes we just know something is wrong. Sometimes we know something is right. Sometimes we have a feeling that something is wrong, but actually, and this the way you just test it is by spending time in the presence of God, asking God to really speak to you. Because sometimes you feel uncomfortable, not because the thing is wrong. You feel uncomfortable because it is hitting at an idol that you are not ready to reveal. So you have to enter into a place of prayer, tell God to speak to you, ask God, let, let God, you know, why I say all these practices of silence, solitude, and all those things is, many times God uncovers the things that are beneath there. So that's the one thing. But it's, please, it's not the only test. The other test is, does it in general follow a life of scripture? So for instance, this job, this job that you, are, that you want to resign from, is it a place that is abusive? Is it a place taking you away from God? Is it a place that they're not even, is not even providing for you? Is it a place that doesn't allow you to develop? All of those things. You have to, and the Bible will teach that God wants things for a flourishing. And then finally, if there's nothing near on the horizon, if you don't have any savings, if you don't have all of those things, that would not necessarily lead you to a place of edification. Maybe I should put a third, one, a third thing, then go and consult people who are spiritually mature. So for me, that's how you handle things. That's how, in some ways, you are rationally trying to take the word of God to apply to what was a revelatory word. And that way you are trying to now balance how we use our rationality from the place of revelation. Okay, I wish I could say more, but we've run way out of time. God bless you all. Have a blessed week.